Uh, but the first speech will be kind of an introduction to the subject and towards uh, we will learn more about it and it will be more advanced on the next session. <laughs> Our first speaker, Pekka, not on a blue screen at the moment, is the uh, founder and CTO of a company uh, startup called Turso. They are bringing uh, SQLite <laughs> to uh, the edge. Um, yeah, he told me that he used to do ba back end and front end uh, programming while Java was still uh, cool. I'm, I'm pretty sure that, I mean, there are still people who think Java is cool, but I mean, maybe in some basements you can find them. No, I don't want to offend anyone. It's, I mean, I'm sure it's, it's, it's Sorry, I keep it's stressing perfectly. you out. I just didn't want everyone to be following along with my emails. So the topic of the talk is beyond cloud computing towards the edge. And this is, this is actually uh, a version of a talk I did at, at the meetup where I was talking about cloud edge uh, serverless and, and sky computing. So, you know, I was already introduced, but just briefly about me, so I'm Pekka. Is it, it's not showing here? Yeah, okay, there's some delay. So I'm Pekka, I'm the founder and city of Turso, bringing replicated SQLite to the edge. We will talk about why SQLite is such a great fit for the edge later in this talk. Um, I'm also a PhD candidate at the University of Helsinki. If you want to know how to combine founding a startup and being a PhD candidate, don't ask my supervisor. And I have background in operating systems, distributed systems, and databases. I had a bunch of front-end people bring me up to speed on Wednesday, so hopefully, hopefully this is going to be relevant for you as well. So there's a small delay now that I switch as well slides for some reason. Okay, I'm going to. So the outline of the talk is why edge. So I'm trying to give you some context and motivation why should you should care. Then I've split edge computing into two parts. So edge compute and edge data which hopefully becomes apparent as we go along the talk. And then we will talk about some challenges with the edge. And actually, before I start, maybe a raise of hands. How many of you here have used edge computing platform? OK, quite a few. How many of you have used serverless platforms? OK, much more. So there is this uh, overlap between edge and serverless. They're not the same thing although some people want you to believe that. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so off we go. So why edge? So let's start with the boring definition of edge computing. It's a paradigm to bring compute and data closer to user to reduce latency. And if you look into edge computing, uh, there are other things as well, like philosophical, it's distributed, you know, users, own their, users can own their own data. Actually, there is some overlap with sustainability, so the, the green computing uh, stuff that we just heard about. But from industry perspective, usually we're just talking about latency advantages. But the obvious question is, why does latency matter, right? So there's a threshold in human perception in, in your brain. And I'm not even claiming to understand the actual details. But what you can basically, what we basically know is that there are these thresholds, right? So 100 milliseconds to a human feels immediate. And actually, if you look at the augmented reality stuff, it's even lower than that from, you know, to, to have this illusion of, of, uh, of uh, the world. But from application perspective, if you can be within 100 milliseconds, that's super great, right? So one second older already to people, it feels instant, but it's noticeable. So the difference is that under 100 milliseconds, people don't even notice, right? And then beyond 10 seconds, it just feels slow, right? And there are studies by Amazon and Google, and actually digged into all of this, and it, it's a little bit shady because there's no actual <laughs> scientific body of work around this. But what companies basically have learned, e-commerce in particular, is you know, the higher your latency is, you're going to lose people, 
You know, they're not gonna, at the checkout, they're not gonna wait. You will see a drop in, in, in revenue and user engagement. So the bottom line is that as application developer, you are working with a latency budget. So hopefully this makes sense. So how can I reduce latency? And now we're talking about edge. So latency, of course, exists in all parts of your application and the systems that you run on. But this is edge computing about co-location. So we're mostly able to tackle network latency. So network latency components, so there's two parts. Uh, at the high level. So there's the geographic latency, which is the latency from physical distance between nodes. We'll get more into this. There's also another part called last mile latency, and that's, for example, the latency from using my cell phone, the latency from the cell tower, the home Wi-Fi, and so forth. We will be focusing here on the geographic latency because actually the last mile latency is super hard to control. Like, if I'm a company delivering an application, I really can't come to your house to, to fix your Wi-Fi. Maybe. So, how do we, how do we, how do we, <laughs> I didn't touch it, I didn't touch it. How do we, do, how do we reduce geographic latency? Yeah, I'm just gonna, which one? I'm not going to touch it. It's, it's, next time it breaks. It's magic. So I can keep talking. <laughs> so co content delivery networks is basically the, a blast from the past. We can go back 25 years. Uh, the internet was, you know, late 90s. The inter internet was booming. People discovered the internet was slow. So content delivery networks appeared to accelerate the web. And examples are, so Akamai, I, I think, was the first one. Today, there's Cloudflare and Fastly. There's CDN. I have a typo. There's CDN providers. Of course, some, the companies do other things as well. But basically, what CDNs are, they're geographically distributed set of servers that cache content close to users for scalability and low latency. So examples of things that CDNs can accelerate are you know, the static assets of your web application. Video streaming is a big one. And then software downloads, although I don't know if that's any, any more relevant. But in the 90s, it was you know, obviously a big thing. So just to quick, <laughs> quickly look at the architecture of a CDN. This, was, uh, this is actually a paper from 2007, tipped by Yuho. So you can see it from the fancy graphics. But basically, the basic architecture of a CDN is that you have something called the origin server, which is on the, my right uh, in the US. And that is the primary source of, of information or content. And then you have these replicated web servers across the world, basically eliminating the geographical latency. And just to briefly look at the different, again, this slide is from 2007, which you can see from the MP3s for example, and the smart home and PDS. But the basic, basically, there's various different user agents that get different types of content and services from the CDN. But there are some challenges with CDN, so lack of dynamic content, right? This is just for caching. Weak consistency model. We'll actually get more into that later in the talk. And then cache invalidation. And there are other th things as well. But, but basically, that's, that's, that's the original edge, right? And then cloud computing comes along if the slide updates, right? So cloud computing has become the mainstream paradigm over the last decade, right? So what you can do is you can provision virtual or physical machines in data centers across the world. So if you go back to the CDN times, usually you would just deploy the server in you know, whatever location you could. You didn't really have access to the whole world because you would have to physically ship a, a, a server there. So this solves the program, programmability for dynamic content, but cloud latency can still be an, an issue for some use cases, maybe, maybe most use cases. So what does cloud latency actually look like? You're a little bit behind again. So this is a screenshot of Google Maps. We are here. You can see the nice 
park which you maybe visited. Uh, and you can almost see the after party place that we're going to do tonight, right? So when you deploy to cloud, where do you, like, what, what does it mean? Well, usually you pick a good default availability zone or, or region. And that would be US East 1. So this this joke about cloud computing being about deploying to US East 1, and edge meaning you deploy everywhere. And the, why is it not showing up? Yeah, so the distance between where we are at and, and where's US East 1 is 7,700 kilometers. And that translates to roughly 120 millisecond latency. And this is just a round trip latency. This is what you, you build everything on top of this. And I was talking to a bunch of folks from US actually on Wednesday, and they were like, that can't be. And the reason is because still a lot of this stuff is US centric. And the web is really fast in the US, <laughs> but not, 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 not for us, at least not always, right? But I was saying also that you can get data centers across the world. And now maybe you're thinking, you know, Pekka, you're cheating. You know, there's obviously a location in, in, in the EU. And there is. There's EU Central 1, for example. There's actually one in Stockholm, but it's not as big as EU Central 1. So this is also a typical um, location. That's 1,600 kilometers, 40 milli, sorry, it's not showing it, 40 millisecond latency, roughly. And this is still workable, but you know, there's not a lot of stuff you maybe can do if you think about the latency budget that, that you might be working with, which is anyway going to be in the hundreds of milliseconds, right? Because if, if you get to, if the, if, a, if the load time gets to a second, then you know you probably are screwed already. So edge latency, I spoiled it already <laughs> because of the technical issues. So edge means something close by. And we are here, and there's an Equinix data center 10 kilometers from here. Actually, it's my favorite data center because it's 10 kilometers from my house as well, right? And that, well, I mentioned already. So that's one to five milliseconds roughly. I couldn't use any of the tools to measure it because everything is cloud-centric. You only measure the distance between, or the latency between different cities. And that can be 10 to 100x less than the cloud. So hopefully I already by now convinced you that yes, you can use the edge to eliminate geographical latency because it's not just my favorite data center in 10 kilometers from here. Maybe I should visit that place one, one time. Right? But it's across the world, right? You have like all the major metropolitan areas where there's enough traffic. Equinix is going to you know, put the data center there. There's other, other providers as well, right? Of course, but I'm just speaking like, Initially, I was thinking there's probably no data centers here in Helsinki, right? But that's the well, actually, Equinix has something even closer to us, but it would have made a terrible slide because the distance is like less than a kilometer. And finally, about edge compute. So when I talk about edge compute, uh, people say it's a buzzword, which maybe it is as well, and it's a bit ambiguous. And one reason is that there's two edges. There's the near edge and the far edge. So near edge is a data center somewhere between the user and the cloud. Far edge, for example, could be this venue or your home or a factory. And basically, we're going to f focus on the near edge because that's where the action is. And as I said, that's what the part that actually reduces the geographical latency and, and the, the, the far edge is still, I think, far away. So that was my motivation for the edge. So let's next look at edge compute, right? So how do you deploy to edge? You have an edge platform, right? So you deploy to an edge using an edge platform, which you can maybe think of as a programmable CDN. And there are two types of platforms, serverless and machine-based. And this is going to be super interesting, because there are people who believe that the edge should be serverless. And then there are people who say that, no, we also need machines. But luckily for us, there are two types of platforms. So 
some, some common serverless platforms, so you have AWS Lambda, Cloud for the Workers, and then DNO Deploy, which is quite new, and then also machine-based. So you have Equinix, where you can basically get these physical machines. There's also a platform called Fly.io, which I absolutely love. It's basically allows you to provision virtual machines across the world using a really slick REST API. So no Kubernetes involved here. But let's go to the edge and servers, because I think that's where much, most of the interesting stuff is happening right now. So a lot of you mentioned or raised hand and said that you've, you've used the serverless platform, so this is not new. So it's a programming model where application is composed of stateless functions. And keep in mind that stateless part as we move towards the later part of this presentation. So an example would be an REST API server that receives an HTTP request and you know, does some processing and sends an HTTP response back. And the reason why people are looking into serverless for the edge is because it's a great fit, fit because of the platform capabilities of extreme multi-tenancy and a little bit of isolation. So it is practical and cost-efficient solution for edge platforms. And just quickly, why is it more cost-efficient? So if you think about this as a one physical machine and a traditional virtualization where you have virtual machines, let's say you can pack four different virtual machines on the, on, on the box where you have your application and you have the V8 runtime, for example, which is the JavaScript runtime here. The way serverless works is that you have one V8, right, or, or maybe a few. And what you do is you virtualize the functions or the, the code, right? So now, you know, this is not even enough, like you can hunt hundreds or thousands of, of functions, which are the application, essentially. This is just, you know. so how do I program serverless? So Cloudflare Workers is one really typical example. And I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, like there will be actual practical talks on how to use serverless and edge. But just to get you a feel uh, that, and, and make it less abstract. So this is an example of a hello world. It receives an HTTP request, and we always send an HTTP response back with the same text, right? And one key thing to realize is this is JavaScript, and it's just the standard web APIs. And with this bit of code and, uh, and CLI-based deployment, you can get that piece of code running on all of these locations, with Cloudflare specifically. So it's, pretty, it's a pretty cool way to take advantage of, of the edge. And just to make the point that this talk is not sponsored by Cloudflare, another example is AWS Lambda. It's more or less the same. Uh, it, the API is just different. And actually, for AWS, it's a bit different because there's AWS Lambda and then AWS Lambda at edge. So I think Lambda is actually deploying to cloud and edge, uh, at edge to edge locations. So that's it for, for edge compute. Just a quick tour around you know, that what you can do. Basically, what you would probably do is you take some fragments of your application and then you make them into servers functions and you deploy it everywhere and that's super fast. But as you remember, I mentioned that serverless is stateless. So what about data? Like what, what do you do when you need some data at the, at the edge? And that's actually not a fully solved problem. But there are two th things that people can do. So the first, first solution, key value stores, typical examples, Redis and Workers KV, again Cloudflare. Uh, <laughs> so key value stores provide this low latency access, like you can't really deploy those key value stores in the edge location. But they only support simple queries or not queries at all in some cases, and they're not transactional. So if you need to update multiple keys, it, it, it won't be transactional. And many of the key value stores uh, are eventually consistent. Um, without going into a lot of the semantics, Eventual consistency basically means that you don't really have any guarantees how your writes get propagated across the different instances. 
And this can be really complex for application developers. Like for example, you're implementing some you know, commenting form uh, or, or commenting thread on, on a web application. So what can happen is that these people write comments from all over the world and then they keep appearing and disappearing because with eventual consistency, you might go to a different replica and so forth. But in any case, the takeaway is that it's, it can be complex. And one of the reasons for eventual consistency here is that if you want to maintain, maintain these copies across the world, you have the exact same problem as CDNs. So one way to think about key value stores at their edge caches and with all the benefits and problems which come with, with caches. Another solution is to use a cloud database. Uh, I, I mentioned Cockroach already uh, on Wednesday and people were like, what's that? Cockroach and Yugabyte are like the original distributed SQL databases with, with where you can actually realistically could have transactionality across different regions. Doesn't stretch across the globe, but nonetheless, new upstarts are Neon and PlanetScale. Well, PlanetScale is, is sharded MySQL, so not that new. <laughs> and then MongoDB. But this is just examples of like this traditional cloud databases, right? And they sup support complex queries. They are transactional. Uh, they can be strongly consistent, so everybody sees the same, same view of the data. But latency can be a problem for edge compute. Because what you have is something called the fan out problem. So let's take an example where you have a client, a serverless function, and then you have that cloud database, right? So the client sends, you do a lot of work to, to batch your request, so you only send one HTTP request to avoid this uh, back and forth. But what if the serverless function has to do multiple database queries? So if the queries are independent, you could parallelize them, but if there is some dependency between the queries, for example, you first search for something and then do something on that data, and then you can do the final query. Then you have a fan out problem. And what it looks like, for example, in the case where we have a client in Sydney, Australia, and now we had this fantastic capability to have the serverless function there, so we have the compute there. But now database is, for example, in Frankfurt. So the total latency is going to be 280 milliseconds by the way, which is the geographical distance or latency between Frankfurt and Sydney, times the number of requests you have to make, which can be pretty bad. And this is actually one of the reasons why you probably don't use a cloud database. You use an edge cache, and then you populate that edge cache from the cloud database. But there's one possible solution, which I call smarter placement, because Cloudflare calls it smart placement. And basically, it's a cool, technique where they're not going to locate the serverless function necessarily close to the user, but to a point where it makes most sense given the total architecture. So for example, if we now locate the serverless function in Frankfurt, Frankfurt, Germany, which we can because you know, we have access to all the different locations, now the main latency we pay is just one time, like from the client to the service function, but the service function can access the database really cheaply. But this is not ideal, and you could ask, you could make the question, <laughs> is this edge, right? So what I've been working on, and a bunch of others, again, including Cloudflare, uh, is something called edge databases, and all of these are SQLite-based. I mentioned SQLite is, is great. Uh, so what are they? So they are databases that support complex queries and are transactional, just like cloud databases. But consistency model is weaker because we still have the same issue as original CDNs, like how do you propagate writes across the different locations, which are many and which are far away. So it's not going to be strongly consistent because that's impractical. For example, what we do is we still provide you transactionality, uh, but it's something called snapshot isolation. So you can read back in time, but any read that you, you do is going to be a consistent snapshot of time. And I believe Lightstream does that, well, that as well, and I suspect. So the first one is actually Cloudflare D1. They don't have a proper logo, so maybe you 
you can ask Kong. But so, so all the three are basically, there's something similar about them, and that is that the query engine, so the thing that you use to execute the query with SQL or MongoDB query language, that is co-located at the edge. And there is some, some kind of a built-in replication capability. But of course, you know, you, you don't get things for, for free. Large data sets still require interoperability with the cloud. So of course, you know, if, 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 you're, if you're thinking about data sets in, let's say, megabytes or, or tens of megabytes, this is super practical. A really typical use case is that you have user data, for example, and then you have lots of these small databases. Uh, but larger data sets require some interoper interoperability with the cloud. And there is no fan out problem with edge databases. Because now you have the client servers function and the database all co-located in Sydney, Australia, for example. So that's, that, that was, that, that's it for edge data. So let's just wrap things up by talking about some of the challenges around edge compute. So data protection. So as I mentioned, many of these well, not many. All of the edge databases that I listed here have some kind of built-in replication capability. So as you start to replicate that data across the globe, now you need to start to pay attention. So GDPR in e European Union is, is known like all the private data, for example, you know, that there are some requirements. So consumers have some rights on the data, and, and then on the other hand, companies have some requirements. And, and that, that can become more complicated with an edge database because with a cloud database, you essentially have your data locked into some or few data centers and you can do all the compliance and, and so forth. So that is an interesting uh, new challenge or new challenge that's with uh, edge databases. Then the edge cloud interoper interoperability. So there's this interesting difference. So the edge has a huge latency advantage, but then on the other hand, the cloud almost certainly is always going to have a capacity advantage. Because you can imagine that AWS is not going to build their super big data center next to my house just to get great latency for me. So there is a reason why they built these data centers at these uh, specific areas. That there was this talk, well, in the previous talk they mentioned how do you get your energy and stuff like that. So that's the, that's the tricky part. And how do we build edge solutions that can transparently take advantage of the edge and the cloud? So I don't think cloud is going anywhere. And, and it's, you're building this almost like a hierarchy of, of data and, and maybe compute. Uh, serverless APIs today, unfortunately, are fragmented. So as you saw with the two examples, if I write for Cloudflare workers, you know, that's not going to be immediately portable to AWS Lambda. For example, there are efforts, uh, working groups that attempt to standardize the APIs. I assume that this will eventually happen, but right now it's still the situation that if you do serverless apps, they're not necessarily portable. And then finally, uh, serverless costs. So this is not really edge problem, but because a lot of edge is serverless, so serverless can be more expensive than machines for you. It's for the providers, it's great, but the issue is that with serverless platforms, what you usually get is usage-based billing, usage-based billing, so how many times you executed that function, for example. And you can go on, on Twitter to find like, some really nasty surprises where due to a bug or whatever, your function got called like a million times, and then you're trying to figure out how I'm gonna pay this $10,000 bill. The, the platforms are, of course, you know, recognizing this and adding controls and, and so forth. But I think fundamentally, the cost, is, cost for serverless is going to be much more difficult to, to, to handle from our user perspective, because the, what you get with serverless is you give up some control for the latency and scalability. Uh, advantages. Mm -hmm.
And that is, that's it. That was, that was the challenges. I'm not going to show you the extras because I spent so much time at the text check. So thank you. I'm Pekka. You can you know, find me here and 